My good friend Ronan uh, Levy is here describing this guy. Uh, Ronan is a lawyer, entrepreneur. He's been in-house for the likes of Ashley Madison, <laughs> CTV, CTV Global. Uh, he was a contemporary of mine. Uh, he was an alumni of Cognition, where I currently work. Uh, he has other ventures as well in the legal space. He has a medical marijuana business. And, oh yeah, he also sells gold. <laughs> yes, he is one guy. Yes, he is more interesting than the Das Equos man or whatever his name, the guy on the beer commercial. Very interesting. Here's why I wanted, I wanted, um, I wanted uh, Ronan to be here. Ronan is all about... Um, unlike, look, it, this has been, this is science now. Lawyers have a mindset when it comes to risk because of the way they've been socialized. He is not your typical lawyer. He is more likely to, to see the risk and measure it and vault over it. Lawyers are not taking enough risk. There's nobody that can debate that. He's going to talk to you about what it is to push, push uh, the envelope and, and deal with risk. I'm here to talk today about understanding risk and, uh, and, uh, how many lawyers are in this room? Are we looking at mostly lawyers? Yeah, OK. Recovering, as they said, recovering lawyers. Recovering lawyers, <laughs> recalcitrant lawyers. Yeah, yeah, I understand. OK, well, that's good, um, because this talk is really directed at you, but it's it, everyone can learn from it. I've given this talk in different forms, actually, to entrepreneurs to help them work with lawyers better. Uh, so I'm going to flip it back and try and put it on to lawyers. Um, and I I'm, think I'm a little bit qualified to talk to this uh, issue because I'm an entrepreneur myself. I've started a few businesses in, in various degrees of somewhat shady areas. I've always liked operating in gray zones because it's a lot of places where there's a lot of opportunity and people just won't go there themselves. Uh, and so in addition to being a lawyer, uh, I've started a cash for gold buyer. So I compete head to head with Russell Oliver. Except, uh, <laughs> Uh, I've started a business, as Jason mentioned earlier, in the medical marijuana space, and uh, and as also alluded to before, I worked uh, I was general counsel for the company that owned Ashley Madison, and uh, that was a very interesting experience. And actually, a lot of what I'm going to talk to today is is based on my experience from Ashley Madison because. It really required a, a whole new approach and a fresh perspective, and you'll hear a lot of anecdotes from that. But um, starting. Something that's always stood out for me from law school was when I was in my first year property class, I had a wine rib who was teaching me, and he was trying to distinguish between what is a lease and what is a... Arnie wine rib. Uh, Arnie wine yeah. And he was trying to distinguish between a lease and a license. And we went through the whole legal test of what's the difference between a lease and a license, and then finally he came to the conclusion that uh, the difference between a lease and a license is based on whatever the court feels like finding. That's what it came down to. And that always stood out to me, because it just showed me that law is not nearly as principled as we think it is, or like to think it is. And, uh, and so we always have to take that context going into every situation. Um, so where I wanted to start actually was with uh, disruption. And if we look at probably some of the three most, at least talked about disruptive companies in the world right now, I would say they are Google, Uber, and Airbnb. Is everyone familiar with all of those companies? Right. And do you know what one of the common factors amongst all three of those companies is? I actually had to add YouTube to it. Is all of them have succeeded not just because they were willing to flagrantly ignore the law, but because they did it intentionally and consciously. You see it with Google and all the privacy, the litany of privacy issues that come out. Same with Facebook. You see it with Uber and how they've been sued by very just, just about every taxi regulation or ordinance in that respect. You see it with Airbnb regarding residential retail. Now the question becomes, as lawyers, it's like, what would you do in those circumstances? Would you sit there when, some, when your CEO comes to you and says, hey, I want to start a business that flagrantly runs in violation of just about every law that governs this area? I suspect, having ex experienced this myself, uh, that most of you would say, no, you can't do that. It's against the law, right? But these are perfect examples of how all of these companies just looked at it and did what they want. I love YouTube as the example, which is like they flagrantly ignored copyright law, right? Flagrantly. Like it's just like, screw it. Put it up there. We'll run with it. And, and look what happened. Not, the thing that's particularly interesting about YouTube is that not only did they flagrantly ignore the law, 
they actually created a whole bunch of business, and, th and that's for, for the content producers, which I found particularly fascinating. So they went out of their way um, to do this, and then all the content producers realized that it's not just about um, you know, TV and protecting their rights. They need to put it out there because that's how they build business in the, in the new model. So that's the context in which I want to start uh, the conversation. Um, when I joined uh, Ashley Madison, I went in from the perspective that most people operate in uh, as lawyers, which is generally risk adverse, rule adherence, trying to focus on the way things should be done from a law abiding perspective. And that really all changed for me one day when I was there. Uh, I had asked a law firm to draft us a new privacy policy because our privacy policy hadn't been updated in probably about five or six years. And it was way behind the times, pretty incoherent. And uh, the CEO of the company actually got mad at me. He actually yelled at me because I had spent $5,000, which I thought was a fairly reasonable sum for a new privacy policy. And, uh, and he got mad at me. And I'm like, why, why would you get mad at me? And he's like, there's two reasons. One is, first of all, privacy law is always changing. You're never going to be in front of privacy law. You're always going to be behind it. So what's the purpose in trying to keep up? You can't actually protect yourself when dealing with that. Uh, and secondly, he's like, as long as you don't do anything with people's personal information that they don't want you to, and of course they do a little bit, but um, you know, they're never going to find out. So what value is a privacy policy? And it kind of reflected quite closely on me at that point, which is like, you're right. There's not a whole lot of value in doing this. And I started to look at that consistently across the spectrum of like, OK, well, is there a legal risk there? Absolutely, there's a legal risk in having a shitty privacy policy. But what's the practical risk? There's virtually zero practical risk of having a bad privacy policy. Just don't do things with people's personal information that you don't want them to, and you won't have an issue. And, uh, and so that's, that's basically it. So I'm, I'm going to run you through a number of examples of anecdotes uh, of where this has come up and how we've dealt with it and moved on. One of my favorites is from one of my business advisors. He's uh, an extremely successful guy. And um, he bought a company in distress. And they supplied a major part uh, to Chrysler. And this was right around the financial crisis time. And uh, he bought the company in distress and he decided he wanted to actually increase the parts. So he was going to increase the price by 30%. And obviously, Chrysler didn't like that so much. Uh, and of course, his lawyers were like, don't do that. You're going to piss them off. We're going to get into a big fight. But he understood that he didn't care. And he understood that was critical to the business. And so what he did, um, he actually got, so he, he announced this to Chrysler, saying we're going to increase prices. Chrysler had a hissy fit, as you'd expect. And they threatened to sue him. They threatened to sue him. They threatened to call the White House. They <laughs> threatened to call the Prime Minister. They were going straight to the top, because it was a critical piece for what they needed in terms of their manufacturing and the dashboards. Uh, and he just held his ground. And so they had a big meeting at a law firm. It was actually at Blake's, the firm I used to work at. And, uh, and uh, so they were there. And his lawyers, you know, it became a legal discussion, ultimately. They were threatening with the law, how he can't do that, and all that kind of stuff. And he knew that they were actually had a number of grounds in which they could rely on the law to stop him from doing what he did. But his thinking was actually non-legal. He took a business approach to it. And this is the way I encourage everybody to think about these situations. He knew that they could go to court, get an injunction, actually seize all the assets of the company if they wanted to. And so what he did, he actually, in the meeting, picked up with, with Chrysler, picked up the phone, and called his COO and told them to take every one of those assets and load it onto a truck, and then start driving those trucks to the Mexican border. Because he knew that as long as it wasn't situated in a warehouse where they could actually seize it, there's nothing they could do. And, uh, and so they actually did that. He actually loaded up, and they started driving across the border. And you know what happened within a few hours of that? Just Chrysler relented. They actually said, OK, we'll pay, because we have to. They realized they couldn't do anything. And, uh, and so. It's, another, it's a situation where the law is kind of irrelevant, right? We spend a lot of time thinking about worrying about what the law says and how we have to operate within its parameters. But then you start to see that the law is really just a way of managing relationships between people or entities, but uh, underlying people. And so as soon as you realize that you can take it out of that situation, take it out of what the law says, and realize what you can and can't be doing, um, you can actually change your perspective. We had a, a, a subsidiary called Establish Men, which was a dating site for sugar daddies. Uh, and, 
and their princesses. And we, and we, got, uh, we got a trademark uh, cease and desist. Now with all my clients, first thing I tell them is if you ever get a cease and desist, the first thing you should do is actually take it and throw it out. Most people, most lawyers don't like hearing that, but that's why I'd advise, because it's a signaling thing at the end of the day, right? Take it and throw it out, because if you give them attention, if you give the other side attention, they're gonna take advantage of that attention, whereas I take the perspective that uh, you have to earn my attention. I'm not just gonna give it to you, uh, but you have to earn it from me. In any event, I didn't listen to the, my own advice at that time, and I responded to their letter uh, very nicely with a, we're not violating your trademark, please, PFO. Um, and of course, they, they came back to me and they said, well, we're going to sue. And uh, Noel, our CEO at the time, was like, we're not going to play that game. We're going to actually engage in this from a leverage perspective uh, because it's all about relationships. And so what we did is we preliminarily went ahead and filed an injunction in U.S. court, not an injunction, but uh, filed an application in U.S. court to have their trademark invalidated before they could actually sue us. So we got the cease and desist, and then we went around their backs and filed this application to have their trademark uh, invalidated in advance so we could get leverage. Uh, so we actually had a basis of a conversation. And once we did that, they were so shocked that they actually came to the table and we realized that there was a really nice opportunity because their business uh, was in gay phone chat in, uh, in, in Vancouver area. Uh, and our business, we had a related business in the same space. And so we actually turned that leverage that we had developed um, from what would have otherwise been a risk to us, i.e. trying to fight this trademark application, uh, and actually turned it into an opportunity. And actually, we, we struck a deal with them. We were able to do a deal where it was mutually beneficial. Uh, but it was all premised on the notion that you don't actually have to pay, play by the rules. You're not actually just, you don't have to do the lawyerly thing of get a letter, read it, respond to it, and go back and forth. You can actually be proactive, be thoughtful, be creative. At the end of the day, it's um, for lawyers, um, one of the things that we're really terrible about at is really being instrumental and critical. One of the things that has come up a couple of times is how um, our profession is changing, how it's being commoditized, how it's being systematized and being done through computers. And so what's left for us as lawyers to do? Well, the thing that's most valuable is start to recognize how we can actually add value instead of protect value. And this is one of those situations where you see like, it's a legal situation, an issue arose, and we were able to take it, and I can't take personal credit for it, but we were able to take it and turn it into a business opportunity. And that's one of the things that lawyers need to start thinking about. We can't sit there and think about what are all the things that can go wrong. We can't think about what's the risk. We gotta think about like, how we deal with the situation and how can we turn it into an opportunity. And the truth of the matter is 99% of the time, uh, there's very little risk involved. I, I've drafted tens of thousands of contracts in my life and not a single one has ever been litigated on. And even those ones that have led to disputes, very rarely does the drafting of what goes into it actually matter. You end up disputing because the contract didn't necessarily indicate everything that you had contemplated. It's like you're contemplating outcomes. But do the letter of the agreement really matter? Not typically, right? And so when I deal with my clients, what I say to them is like, what's the value? Like, what is the practical risk? And I say like 99% of the time, this contract is not gonna have a dispute. And in that 1% of the time that a dispute comes up, 99% of the time you're gonna be, be able to resolve it amicably. And in the 1% of the time that you're not able to resolve it amicably, you may start to go to court, but then you can actually just settle at that, at that point if you're on the wrong side of the law, right? So again, when you talk about spending tens, tens, of, tens of thousands of dollars in drafting contracts and going back and forth, as a lawyer, you really have to question. It's like, is this really worthwhile to my client? Am I actually benefiting my client by actually fighting over this small point? And I, can guarantee, I can't guarantee it, but almost certainly every time the answer is no. As long as you think through all possible outcomes and make sure that they're somewhat accurately reflected in an agreement, you're doing your client a big service. But by fighting over the little words and the commas and the indemnities and all those smaller points that almost are never relevant to the actual outcome of your business, you're doing a client disservice. So start to recognize that we deal too much in risk. We think about risk too much um, and that often the risk just doesn't exist. At the end of the day, we start to Sorry. I was going to say, we, we gamble. I mean, we start to have to 
we start spending money and dealing with risks that are so unlikely and so infrequent, it's almost like gambling by throwing your money towards these things. Or insurance is another way to look at it. And I personally don't have much faith in insurance because it has to, by definition, be money losing to the average person. Otherwise, insurance companies couldn't make money. But that's really what we're dealing with. And so when you start to take a perspective around that, um, you start to be able to add value. And your, your clients, or if you're in-house, as I've been most of the time, uh, they start to see you as a linchpin. So you're not just a problem creator and you're just not a no person. You actually become a yes person and figure out ways to do things instead of uh, trying to stop things. Definitely situations in which you have to be conservative. I, I absolutely agree. But for the most part, because every situation like that, litigation fundamentally is a relational thing, right? Uh, all of it depends on leverage, strategy, and negotiation. And so as long as you're pushing forward with something that's going to get you leverage so you can actually come to the table and have a conversation that's going to reach a mutually beneficial or at least improved situation, um, it, uh, you know, it, it's worth being aggressive or at least being thoughtful. I, uh, I belong to an entrepreneur's network and um, one of my member, one of my co-members in that is in a lawsuit, was in a lawsuit with a co-founder and uh, this actually inspired one of my one of my business ideas, and uh, he asked me my 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 opinion on it, and I didn't know a lot of the facts, but I said like, "Well, what are you doing? Have you countered sued?" And he's like, "No, I don't think so." And I'm like, "Why not?" And he's like, "Well, I don't know if I have the basis of a claim." I'm like, "I don't really care if you have the basis of a claim. What you need to do is give them a reason to come to the table and want to talk settlement." But but, but you're right. You're right. It's not necessarily ideal, but it's the only way you can frame the real conversation. Because if you just ask for permission, like I've dealt with this in, in a lot of my business, go to a people want to go to regulators and ask for permission. I'm like. You're just going to get a no because they don't have an incentive to see us uh, pipe in. I was, I was reading an article in Inc. Magazine the other day, and, and they had um, a number of entrepreneurs, extremely successful entrepreneurs, and they said, like, what's the biggest risk to small business and disruption in, in entrepreneurship? And they said, regulation is the biggest risk because you have such vested interests lobbying for laws and policies that protect their interests. And so kind of going back to the root of my talk is that Someone's got to fight that. Someone's going to have to push the boundaries. And you can either play within the system, which is already rigged by them to keep you down, or you can fight in different ways and look at different opportunities. Right now, um, in the medical marijuana startup, and this is just an example of good law versus bad law, um, our business is based on promoting medical marijuana. That's essentially what it boils down to. And under the Narcot Narcotic Control Act in Canada, you can't actually promote it. Um, even though medical marijuana is legal, you can't promote marijuana. It's, a, it's an inherent conflict in the law that doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. Um, but we wanted to get some advice on this. And so we called uh, a law firm. Um, and I told the lawyer, being a lawyer that we spoke to, I'm like, I don't want no as an answer. I don't want you to tell me that I can't do this. I want, to t want you to tell me how I do this. And he came back and he said, you can't do this. And I'm like, that's specifically what I told you not to do. <laughs> and, then, and the next day we had a, a meeting with Alan Young. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Alan Young. He's amazing. He's a great lawyer. So we sat down with him. We pitched him on the same business model. And he's like, yeah, it's against the law, but we can get that law thrown out. Don't worry about it. He's like, do your business model. That's exactly what I said to us. I'm like, that's awesome. He's like, he's a guy who was able to look at the legal situation and actually consider the real ramifications of like, what happens if they come after you? Well, you have this backup. So he said, do your business model and just go for it. He's like, well, deal with it when it comes, right? You can't anticipate every single risk. And even then, like, I'm, I'm more risk loving than my business partners who are actual entrepreneurs, not lawyers. Uh, and they always want to like, stop and I'm like let's push the boundaries let's let's advertise because what's gonna happen no one's gonna come and shut down our business no one's gonna throw us in jail what's gonna happen is we're gonna get a letter and that letter we can probably ignore or we can abide by it but what's the risk we took a huge gamble and the risk is so small right it really changes everything when you look at the fact that most of the time the worst that's gonna happen is you get a letter and you change right we can be responsive instead of anticipating every single issue that arises and that's the way I like to look at it with my clients and in my businesses. Absolutely. And, and, and that's entirely true, and that's true of any disruption or innovation. That's going to happen, and I'm not advocating that we should be callous and, and not protect people, but I also don't think that we should not do something because there's a the theoretical lit litigation risk or legal risk in the future. It's like move forward, try and do your due diligence to make sure people don't get hurt, 
but again, this is all business conversation. Like I don't. One of the things I've often said to people is like, I don't think, at least dealing with business, that you a business ever needs legal advice, except in the context of litigation. They need business advice. They need to be able to do what they want to do in a way that minimizes their risk. But the fundamental part of that is they need to be able to do what they want to do. It's just how you get there. Instead of saying no, help them get to where they want to go. Um, you know, talking about the risk of litigation, just another example. One of the things that we did uh, once is uh, we, we decided to play with trademark law when I was at Ashley Madison. And, and it, we actually learned this by getting screwed by it. There was a website called AshleyMadisonSucks.com. <laughs> and, uh, and it just had reviews and all this information, you know, talking about how bad Ashley Madison is, both from like a moral perspective and, and from like a, just an experience if you actually sign up, what happens. And so we tried to stop him and we tried to sue him and we realized that there was no law on our side that he was perfectly legitimately allowed to have a hate site about what we do and there's nothing we could really do to stop him and so we said okay well if you can do that we can do that and so we ended up buying up a whole bunch of domains with whatever sucks.com and used it for comparative advertising right again we knew that we would probably get trademark lawyers threatening us and all this kind of stuff and we could respond to it at the time but every single time it was just like please stop doing that and we stopped doing it but out of that, we actually made a whole bunch of money, developed a whole bunch of awareness, and uh, moved our business forward. So I have a lot of respect for the law society or the rules of professional <laughs> conduct, as you probably can tell. Um, I do, yes. And you know, I, I kind of invite, almost like preaching what I practice. Like, I want to start uh, one of the businesses I've been working on is something called Mayfair 7. And essentially what that does, the part of law I like is talking strategy and figuring things out from a business perspective. It's like understanding the law, but let's you know, look at it from a business perspective. Things I hate are drafting contracts, due diligence, all that mundane reading and writing stuff. The fun stuff for me is that high level stuff. Um, and I want to do that for businesses. And I want to do that for businesses all over the world, because I actually consider it business consulting, right? I don't think it's a legal decision. I think it's a business decision. In that case, it's like, why do I have to be in a law firm? I want to be in a corporation. I don't want to be in a law firm or a sole proprietor or professional corporation, whatever it is. And I want to do that. I want to stand up to law society and be like, I, I'm a lawyer. Or even if it's in the US, like if I had a California client, because I'm not qualified, which is actually interesting, but I'm not qualified in California, but I want to be able to advise California clients. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm not a lawyer down there, so I'm going to do it in some other construct. And if they want to try and stop me, again, feel free to try and stop me, but I'm going to at least engage that dialogue before you can stop me. All right? I'm not going to not do it. Uh, because there's a the theoretical risk that the ABA or the Bar Association in California is going to strike me down. And even if they try to, it's going to start with a letter, and then we're going to have a conversation, and I can make a decision rationally from there as to what to do. And also, like, I think that's what came out of even the introduction you know, this morning, is that the, the truth is, I mean, law and technology and all of this stuff is interconnected. The law and the law society of Upper Canada, and specifically here, I mean, I think we're going to, we, innovators, if we are, are going to have to like pull them kicking and screaming into the like this century. Like it's just, they're just, you know, even the law in the area of technology and information is just operating on like a whole different, and no offense, the judges are operating with all due respect to them, like they're 70. They just, I'm not saying like ageism, but they're clueless, right? right. They're just, you know, they're, they're, I don't want to be rude, but they're just really not, haven't lived in the internet age as a 20 year old, right? They, you know, so there's a whole discussion there. But yeah, kicking and screaming and pushing the limits of the law, I think, is totally ethical. I mean, again, barring telling somebody to go kill somebody or whatever. Of course. I mean, I mean the yeah. obvious duh that you don't need the law society to tell you. I think it's really, yeah. Law is a living organism, and the law society is a dying organism, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A critical component is like, Think about it. Like, think about the deal that's coming across your plate and look at the paperwork. I don't worry so much about what the actual words say, but I want to make sure that every scenario that could be contemplated has been contemplated and reflected properly. 99% of disputes that do arise are not because the contract is, is, is it, they arise because the contract isn't fully thought out, right? Like, if you had spent some time to consider all the possible ramifications of every scenario, and reflected that properly in the agreement, then you wouldn't have a dispute because it's already been contemplated. So uh, as long as the agreement, from my perspective, has been thought out, then the, the details of it tend to be moot in my consideration. So, uh, but, but 
going back to sort of my original point is like this is how you become a linchpin in an organization. This is how lawyers actually start to add value. You don't be the no people. You don't say you can't do that. Your attitude should be how do we do this? Or like, yes, there's risk involved, but it's a manageable risk and we'll deal with it when it comes up. And I think that's one of the reasons my clients like working with me, because I always say yes. Well, there's usually a yes, but, but I always say yes. Like don't ever lose a deal over some small, small negotiating point, because odds are it's not gonna matter. Odds are it's not gonna matter. It could matter, but that's the risk you take. Business is all about taking risks and smart risks. And like you have to have the right attitude of like, I'm going to try and push things I'm going to piss people off because inevitably innovation does that because it displaces people and I'm going to deal with it. I was at a, a startup weekend event once and there's some group of people that wanted to, uh, it really frustrated me, they wanted to start a business where they were going to scrape data off of um, all the coupons and flyers that were out there and aggregate it for people. So instead of having to get all the separate ones, you can go to a website and like actually comparative, compare between Loblaws and Sobeys and all that kind of stuff. And they stopped it because someone told them that it violates the terms and conditions of the websites that they're going to be scraping the data from. And I'm like, why don't you do it to start? And then if you get that letter, respond to it and deal with it at that point. Because usually, usually you're going to be too small uh, for them to care. And when you become big enough for them to care, then you actually have a point of real conversation as opposed to just having to go away. Um, and so, you know, like I said, it's just the mentality and attitude of like, Say yes, try and get things done. Don't say no. Don't be afraid of pissing people off or getting letters um, because you can always respond to them and react accordingly. It's never, it never goes from zero to 100. It always goes from zero to the first cease and desist letter. Uh, and, and then you can move on from there.